Hey friends, this is Jessica from Jessica's Rabbits coming to you on a lovely fall day from Brooklyn, uh, right before the Kings County Fiber Festival that is happening tomorrow at Old Stone House. So I just wanted to go through a bit about what Jessica's Rabbits is and what we do and the best part, uh, the buns. So this is the screen that we're looking at right now is the my website where most of the sales and promotions that I do lived, especially in a time of COVID. Uh, Jessica's Rabbits was, while I've had rabbits for about six years, I didn't launch this, my little business until last year during Corona. Uh, it was a great lockdown activity to have um, a lot of buns and yarns to take pictures of and build this little e-com site. So that is how this came to be about. But if you go to jessicasrabbits.com, that is our URL. And you'll see on the homepage is just a lot of our recent yarns and the buns. Uh, the business is called Bunny Town because one main philosophy of the business is putting the welfare and happiness of the bunnies first. So the first bunny I got was actually this little guy over here, Jojo Cinnabon. And I'm going to introduce you to him on this page. So I'll talk a bit more about the website navigation in a little bit, but just you know to get an overview of, of who we are. This is Mr. Jojo Cinnabon. He and I met at Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival six years ago this month. And I wasn't really planning on getting a bunny or starting a yarn business necessarily. I had just gotten into spinning. Actually, I just gotten into knitting. I, I came to the fiber arts later in, in life from you know people who started as children. I was maybe 29 or 30 when I started knitting when my little nephew was born and I wanted to make him a blanket and knitting quickly turned into wanting to know how to spin yarn and then wanting to spin yarn quickly turned into wanting to have my own fiber animals. But living in New York City, it was pretty limited in what kind of you know, little furry friends I could get. So when I saw little Jojo at Sheep and Wool, um, I just fell completely in love with him. And I live in a in an old Victorian house in Brooklyn. So I'm very lucky to have space and, uh, you know, an outbuilding in the yard and a yard that I converted into Bunny Town. So um, yeah, that's how, how this all started with one bun. And then very quickly, Jojo was just so charming that I had to get more. So I wanted to do now is just show you a bit about each individual bun and the different types of Angora that there are. A lot of times when you hear Angora, um, people who aren't familiar with the little, little critters think that there's always just one type of Angora when in fact there are five different types of Angoras. So if you go, if you're on this site and you go to meet the buns, they're all, all the different rabbits that I have are here, but I wanted to chat a bit about the different types of Angora that exist. So up first, we'll, we'll start with Jojo. Um, so you can see on his face here that he has shorter fur on his face as opposed to like Oliver over here or Heidi over here. And then like Edgar right down here and baby Jojo, their faces look more like traditional wild rabbits where they've got fur on their face, but it's not really long or, um, you know, it's called facial furnishings. It's not super long and it doesn't molt. And also on the top of their head, there isn't a ton. So these little ones are called satin Angora. So like Edgar Allan Bunn here is a satin and they have the usually darker hair on on their face and their head. And then throughout their body, it kind of goes to lighter color. And so you can see here, this is Edgar's angry picture. He was mad at me for taking so many pictures of him, but he's called a black satin Angora. And usually the color that you can tell what their you know, differentiating color is, is the, the color of their face. So Jojo here, um, he is a red Angora. And you can see that, you know, it's more orange, but they call it red. And then it kind of lightens into the back. And so the qualities of this fiber of the satin is, as you can expect, a uh, really satiny, um, shiny finish almost. So this is another one of my satins. This is Mr. Maxwell. And their coat, I mean, it's all very, very soft. Satin Angora has a very fine texture to it. And it almost has a silk quality in terms of like slipperiness and sheen. And um, 
it's just overall, it combines like a super soft Angora with the shine of like a, a soft silk almost. And so what I do with satin a lot is I'll mix it with other other types of silk. I usually do all vegan fibers. So it'll be um, like a, I'm doing air quotes uh, with, with my hands right now, uh, you know, silk in the way that it's like a plant fiber that is processed to, you know, feel like silk, like banana fiber is one, um, sea cell that comes from seaweed is another, rose bush fiber. So they all have this like silky soft shine to it uh, without, without any animals being hurt. Uh, so going back to the Meet the Buns page, the other type of, or one of the other types of Angora are these little English bunnies. So whenever you see like famous rabbits on Instagram, famous Angoras, a lot of times it's these English friends. They have, they're like the quintessential, like super floofy face and ears. And they're just like 100% fluff. And these little guys are uh, the smallest of the Angora. And so little Oliver Molliver here probably weighs about five or six pounds across all different types of buns. The uh, males usually weigh a little less than the females. Um, so like Bonnie here is another English Angora and she's just got just so much fluff. I call her my little vegan meatball because sometimes you like just literally can't tell which side is her head and which side isn't because she's just this complete giant ball of fluff. Uh, so the qualities of the English fiber are exceptionally fine, really soft. I'm not sure if there's an actual micron count difference in them. The micron is the, the measure of, basically the measure of softness, to put it in, in a very non-scientific way, that the lower the number, the softer the fiber. So uh, Angora is like a, you know, can be like an 11 to 13, um, whereas most Merino, like uh, super fine, merino or you know like fine merino is about like an 18 um and like baby alpaca can be like 16 to 18 so angora is super super soft so the english have uh some of the the softest that there is and they also produce the least amount because they're so little um so this is sammy she's another english and actually my smallest little guy is walter white here he is a what's called a blue-eyed white so you can see it literally delivers what it promises that his eyes are blue and he is white. So blue eyed white as opposed to the um, red eyes. And so he's just a fierce little fluff ball and he's tiny, but doesn't take crap from anybody. Uh, so that is English. Then moving on to giant. So the opposite end of the size spectrum, we have Mr. Roger Rabbit here. He is, so giant Angoras are a pretty recent, creation, literally, um, a woman up in Massachusetts, Louise Walsh, bred, I believe it's a Flemish giant with a German Angora uh, to get a molting version of a very large Angora and giant Angoras are what happened. So these, these little guys and girls are, as the name implies, quite large and they come in a multitude of colors. What you see the most at shows, I don't do shows, but um, there are a lot of red-eyed whites. So this is Mr. Tommy the train here. Um, oh, actually I lied. Tommy is a German. Oh, so let's pretend I didn't click on that. Um, so Roger, and then my white giant is Heidi, Heidi Klum. So you can see on both, you know, Roger and Heidi, they do have some of the furnishings on their ears and their face. So they're a mix in facial floofiness between the satin and the English. Uh, and a lot of times you do see them with, you know, white coats. Those are the ones that are probably the most prolific, at least in the States uh, that I am aware of. And so since I gave you a sneak peek of Mr. Tommy the train, let's go over here. So this is little Tommy and he is a German Angora. So it looks very similar to Heidi in terms of size and coloring. Uh, German, the big differentiating factor with German Angoras as opposed to, um, as opposed to other Angoras are that uh, they don't molt. And so they, um, you have to shear them. So all of the other types of Angoras, they grow multiple lengths of fiber and multiple coats of fiber at the same time. Whereas, and, and then once the top coat is really kind of ready to fall out, it just starts falling out. And so you just have to, um, 
like brush it and kind of like with like a dog comb and it comes out and that's how you collect the fiber. Whereas with Mr. Tom here and his other German friends, you need like dog, like buzzers, like the clippers to shear them. And so that's the biggest thing with them. And German and giants, uh, as one might expect to produce the most amount of fiber. So we've got German, we've got giant, we've got English, and we've got satin. Then the only other type of Angora that I actually don't have one of is French. And I had one French little Frankie the bun many years ago. He didn't, um, he got suddenly very ill and passed away. He was a super sweet little dude, but French, they look the most like satin Angoras here uh, in terms of their size and their face and their fiber. But the biggest difference between French and the others is that they have, their fiber is more guard hair. So guard hair is like, like within, you know, sheep or other types of um, fiber animals that it's the longer hair that doesn't have any crimp to it. And it gives Angora that really traditional halo look of, you know, the, the super fuzzy, super soft, um, kind of like flyaway type look. And so <clears throat> that is what French is most known for. So those are the different types of buns. And then on this page with within each of their little pages, you can see, um, so with the emphasis, putting the emphasis on the animals and their happiness, one thing that I really hope to portray with um, this site and my business is that each little critter has such a distinctive personality and that um, while, you know, rabbits or other fiber animals can be, you know, seen as agricultural, each little critter does have just a super strong little, you know, personality and what they like to do, what maybe they aren't so much of a fan of. Um, and they definitely let you let you know it. They don't vocalize uh, really ever. They do thump. Thumper and Bambi is, is a real thing. Um, the only vocalizations that rabbits make is if they're really, really terrified, they will scream, like literally scream, like, ah, and it's terrifying. I've heard that once when one of my bunnies thought that a plastic bag was a predator and that it came to eat him, but he was fine and he, he recovered well. Um, but uh, other than that, they will occasionally make little like, mm, like chattering sounds. And if they're really happy, they'll grind their teeth together like a cat purring. So little Jojo does that all the time. Whenever I give him a hug, his little teeth chatter. And so it sounds like if you're really cold and your you know, teeth are chattering, that's what it sounds like with them. Um, oh no, whoops. And so then for uh, another element that I wanted to chat about in terms of the, you know, rabbits first and animal welfare is our cute for a cause initiative. So this is, this was founded by Oliver Molliver, who's this little guy in the center here. And so cute for a cause is basically our giving back program that all of these little furry friends here are animals that um, I've either fostered or adopted from Sean Casey Animal Rescue that uh, people in Brooklyn, I'm sure that name sounds familiar. For those uh, outside of the Big Apple, Sean Casey is uh, a really amazing guy who has a shelter and they take in all kinds of animals, um, obviously dogs, cats, guinea pigs, gerbils, hamsters, snakes, turtles, I mean, you name it, they'll take it. And they're a completely no-kill shelter and have um, their headquarters or, you know, their main shelter is in um, Kensington, Brooklyn, which is about like a five, 10 minute drive for me. And so these are little friends that over the years I've um, had in my life. This is Pebbles and one of her babies, they were a foster. This little superwoman over here is Joy, who's currently sleeping on my lap. She is a foster fail. Um, this is Benjamin Button, who's a guinea pig I adopted. So all that to say that a portion of all uh, yarn sales are donated to Sean and his crew to care for the animals, either in a direct donation or in um, they go it goes, goes towards caring for the animals that I foster uh, from them that later go on to be adopted by by loving homes. So that's a really you know important part that. It kind of comes full circle that the animals, um, you know, the bunnies, they don't need their fluff anymore once it falls out, but then they're, you know, helping their little, um, their little bunny friends with, or, you know, just animal friends in general with, uh, with being good little citizens. Uh, so then on to the yarn. So Angora, uh, so if you're on the website, there are a number of ways that you can get to the yarn. Um, different types of yarn offerings on the site. And there are a lot of different collections uh, that I focus on. As you can see from the homepage, I'm going through a real pink technicolor phase in 2021. 
I originally was really into natural colors of, you know, like down here and really not doing any dye. But then um, this yarn here is called Bunicorn is one that I made on accident. Um, and then it turned out to be one of our bestseller. So I just really kind of dove into the acid dye. But before we get into that, I'm just going to talk about um, the different elements of like Angora fiber and how to prep it and how to spin it, how to dye it and all of these things. So what you can see here in the, that's not the page I want to, let's go over here. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Okay, so this is, this photo right here is uh, angora fiber that is clearly clearly dyed and carded. So you can spin angora straight from the bunny if the bunny is molting. Um, when I tried to do that, I got pooped on a lot, so I don't do that anymore. But you can, um, or you can collect it and just spin it straight from, it's called from the cloud, that you don't comb it, you don't card it, you don't dye it, you just spin it straight. But what I prefer to do most is to dye it what's called in the wool. So you dye it when it is just wool and not um, not processed. And then you can card it together in into all these fun colors. And so there you really get a big overview of the, you know, it's more control in the color than I find dyeing it once it's spun because you can get those, you know, colors that shouldn't mix that turn into like brown you know, really close together when you cart it and dye it in the wool. And so then it's just, you can get a lot more of that like variation of like here where it's all mixed together, where like doing that um, once it's already spun would, would be, excuse me, would be a big challenge, but um, doing it in the wool is, is much, much easier. And so once it's, you know, dyed and carded, then you can, you know, spin it directly there. A lot of times I will also blend it with other fibers in the drum carter. So this is a new yarn of ours called Bandala, like Mandala. And this is a mix of Angora, of course, and recycled sari silk. And so, and then there's a, an auto wrap silk thread. Um, and so this type is super fun. Yeah, in this picture, you can see all the like subtle color variations that come up when you card it prior to spinning it. Um, and this, so silk, this is actually real silk, It's um, but I'm using it because it's, so recycled sari silk is from, saris as one, one might guess, from India that's left over from the manufacturing and um, sewing of sari. And so it's just waste of the textile industry that you can get in roving form and mix together. Uh, this is another one of the yarns that is carded prior to spinning. This is called Bun Leave in Miracles. And this uh, came about because it was a tough time in Bunny Town this, this spring. Um, Jojo Cinnabon, who's just my little soulmate bunny, got deathly ill. Um, like literally he was about to be uh, euthanized. They thought he wasn't going to make it, but he had a little spark in his eye. So I brought him home and he's made a full recovery. And so this is a yarn that I created for a knit and escape. Uh, um, virtual retreat, which is Christy Glass's, uh, one of her, her babies. And it's just a delightful, um, usually a weekend, you know, cyber event. There's an in-person one coming up soon, but I'll usually do custom, um, you know, specials for that. And the theme was magic. So I thought what better way to celebrate magic than Jojo making a miraculous recovery. But what you can see here is that it's all, again, that like subtle color variation that comes from carding it prior to spinning it. And in this one, I discovered, it's hard to see in the pictures, but there's a little bit of sparkle, which is a synthetic fiber. It's like a plastic, um, uh, it's called Angelina in some places and some other sites, it's just called sparkle, but it adds a little bit of shine to it. And this is also from a Merino sheep named Ratty, who lives in Australia. I do blend, if I blend with other animal fibers, the uh, main the main point that I look uh, look to in the shop is to see how the animals um, are treated and if they're you know well cared for and so I'll you know and all the, also small other small businesses, women owned farms or micro farms like what I like to call my little Dittons Park um, adventure is really important to me. So you know people who might not have um, you know huge quantities of of animals, but you know 
care for each one like a little furry child. Uh, so yeah, this is a super fine merino. And when I say super fine, I mean like like micron of three super fine. So it's like a spongy, squishy, super, super fine yarn. Uh, then another way of spinning Angora. This is an example of a yarn I did for India Untangled in the spring. Sorry for the background noise. My dog is one, of, actually this is Cinnamon, one of my foster dogs from Sean Casey right now is, she's having a special moment. Um, but it's called Merbun Parade. And this was for a pre-summer spin where uh, in New York, the uh, Mermaid Parade is, is a big thing. I think it's been canceled the past two years because of, because of COVID, but uh, I wanted, so this is a merino bun, um, bunny mix. And so I thought mermaid, mer bun parade. Uh, um, the bun puns are just, they, they, I can't stop doing them. I just, I can't stop. I, people tell me too, but I can't. Um, so this is one where I spun it and then dyed it. And you can see here that, you know, the, it's more like solid colors with little speckles of color. And so this is another way of, um, if you just have, you know, want to just spin up a bunch of white and then dye it afterwards that you can do that the more traditional indie dyer way where you, you know, have spun yarn and then dye it directly onto there. I do this a little less frequently too, because although I do have a lot of outdoor space, my New York kitchen is a New York kitchen. And so sometimes it's either a decision between uh, cooking dinner or dyeing yarn and yarn always wins and then takeout is my best friend. Uh, so that's why I do this, this method a little bit less. Uh, and then let's see another one that is dyed. So this is another yarn called Bunfetti that is spun and then dyed. And so here too, you can see that there's more blocks of color and little speckles of color than the color really interwoven within the same like half inch of yarn. And so this was a fun adventure getting on the uh, speckle dyeing train that is just ever so popular nowadays, which is great. Um, let me show you also a natural one. So this is uh, a spin, this is called Jojo is a Badass. And this is going back to another tribute to Mr. Jojo for beating kidney failure and three UTIs and a skin infection and, you know, he did it all. So this is one that is a completely natural colored yarn. There is a, if you look really closely, there's a rose gold ply on it. And that is, um, just to add a little bit of extra extra sparkle. And so there's also some uh, plant silk fiber in here that is this like golden hue that matches really well with Mr. Cinnabon's natural natural beauty that he's born with. Um, do, do, do. Oh yes, and so speaking of other fibers, uh, I'm gonna show you guys a few that are fibers that I've mixed with some unusual, or Angora that I've mixed with some unusual fibers. So this is called banana. And this is getting back to that recycled um, or the plant silk concept. This is from actual banana trees, that it's the bark of banana trees and it's waste and they um, process it kind of like how linen is and you know um, get out each, like there, it's kind of like in a thread form. And so with that, I'll blend it with a drum carter or by hand with Angora and then use animal dye, um, heat reactive, uh, protein reactive dye on both the animal and the plant fiber to get this kind of mix where some of the banana fiber turns color, but a lot of it retains that like kind of silky white, which is really fun because um, it's just, you know, an interesting way to play with dye because you can see, you can really experiment with how much of the plant fiber is going to take up the dye versus the, the animal. So that's a really fun one. And then this line um, called Alice in Wonderland. This is one of the craziest um, kind of collaborative yarns that I've done where this has basically any fiber animal that there is, it's in this yarn. So there's of course Angora, there's Superfine Merino from my sheep friend in Australia. There's mohair, which is from Angora goats, which is what creates these little like flyaways. Um, that's called uh, tail spinning and core spinning. So it's a different mixture depending on the length of the lock, but all of these ones. Um, so it just creates this super funky, you know, kind of art yarn twist that um, I find really fun. I see this used a lot in um, weaving. So it creates like the table looms 
or sorry, nope, not table, but yeah, table looms or the lap looms. This just makes a really, really fun like art yarn scarf. And then there's one other kind of spinning technique to talk about. So you can see I do a lot of the spiral plying because that's where you take a single thread of yarn and you ply it with um, a super skinny thread. And so a lot of times I'll use like cotton thread, a silk thread, and it creates this like kind of funky twisty texture, which I really, really like um, because it's a way to keep, not make it super bulky, but it adds a little bit of air in between. So it gives space in each stitch for the Angora to really blossom and halo as you wear it and work with it. And then it also just, you know, adds some extra three dimensionality. That's a tough word. Uh, it does that though. So this one, this Bun Birthday Tea Party, this is um, one of the most kind of like time consuming spins, but it creates this really cool, this is called a super coil. And so you can see it's almost like these little like worms, which is an unpleasant image to think of in yarn. Forget I said that. It's like, I don't know, little branches. Nah. But you can see that there are individual little like uh like divisions in between the yarn and so that you take kind of what i do with all the other yarns and then there's an added step of plying it onto a silk or not a silk like a cotton thread some kind of a core and then you just like keep pushing it up as you spin so it makes these like hive type structures which is which is super fun and so that one this is a very heavy yarn like literally heavy it's like five ounces or I'm sorry, no. So this one is 20 yards, 2.4 ounces. Yeah, so 40 yards, it's like five ounces. So it is a very hefty yarn. It's great for like accents, um, hat brims. And so that actually leads into another question that I get asked a lot of like, what kind of patterns do you suggest for your yarns? And so Angora is, with it being a luxury fiber, both for the softness, the warmth and the price, it, uh, definitely something where a little bit can go a long way you can do of course you know an entire sweater out of angora um it has definitely been done before but it doesn't retain its shape uh quite as well as some of like the springier merinos um and so what i recommend a lot is accessory projects for angora so any of these uh any of these yarns work delightfully as a hat as gloves fingerless mitts scarves uh, I do sometimes in, mix them together in like a poncho or ruana type situation with a super fine alpaca um, and really keeping the Angora near where it's going to be next to your skin to keep it really soft. Another great quality of Angora is that it is water resistant. And so the, um, you know, if you're out in the snow, uh, water will really kind of just sit on the top of say it's a hat. It'll just sit on the top little beads of water and your head won't get wet. Sometimes I always tell the story that, um, you know, the bunnies, they have um, play pens out in my yard when weather permits, they, um, you know, go out there and frolic and dig and pee everywhere. And uh, sometimes if it starts to drizzle and I don't notice, and then I go out there and I'm like, oh no, it's drizzling. They'll just be like, a, like beads of water on the very top of the bunnies coats. And they like, don't even know that it's um, raining. So, and actually that also when you have to dye angora fiber you've got to soak it for like at least 24 hours prior to applying any dye because it just it doesn't get wet which is great for accessories um and then another project that's really perfect for especially these kind of funky or art yarn type spins is uh weaving and you know also crochet with with these textures and the space in between each fiber uh it allows for a lot of that halo to come out. So the more that you work with Angora, the more you wear a finished Angora product that you know fuzz will come out. And it's not like a shedding fuzz. It's like just that it adds like a you know quarter inch of just like super fine floof on the top of each finished product, which is super cool. Um, but it's actually really warm. So it's actually eight times warmer than sheep wool, fun fact. And that really makes it super ideal for winter projects too. Um, so those are all of the big overviews that I wanted to share with you. Um, I hope that you guys all come to the Kings County Fiber Fest. If you are seeing this afterwards, come back next year. It is uh, been, this is the 10th year it's happening and it's just a fabulous you know, event for folks in the city to gather and celebrate all things fiber. 
Um, it's the, you know, kind of, for me, it's always the official kickoff of knitting season and sweater weather every, every fall in New York. So if you guys have any questions about uh, me, the bunnies, anything um, Angora related, if you go to the connect on, uh, on the site here, you can email me directly here. You can email me at Jessica at jessicasrabbits.com. Uh, you can Instagram me. Um, I will say this fall, I've been failing hard on the social media presence. I'm a musician and a writer in my non yarn life. And that has um, been a really hectic fall. So if you did email me and I haven't gotten back to you yet, I will do it soon, I promise. But uh, thank you guys all so much for listening and watching. And I hope to meet you in person soon. Happy knitting.